Welcome friends to this lecture on urinalysis. We'll be discussing the practical aspects of it. A special thanks to my entire department for helping me put up this video. Uh, the important thing about urinalysis is that it's a very non-invasive test. The patient can give the sample anytime and a simple screening test of the urine can give us information about a lot of diseases like it's the screening test for diabetes. We can detect kidney function. We can discuss liver disorders. We can check the presence of glomerulonephritis, urinary tract infection, and nowadays urine investigation becomes a very important test for screening inborn errors of metabolism. So what are the tests done in the urine examination? We have physical examinations and we have chemical examinations. In the physical examination, we look at the amount of the volume of urine which has been void, preferably over 24 hours collection. We look at the color of the urine, the smell of the urine, the pH of the urine, and the specific gravity. Each of them have certain changes which have characteristic signatures for diseases. In the chemical examination, we check for the presence of proteins, glucose, ketone bodies, blood, bile salts, and bile pigments. The first physical property that we check up is urine output and the urine output for 24 hours, which would be about 1 to 1.5 liters of urine. When the urine output is less than 500 ml per day, we call it oliguria. And when the urine output is less than 50 ml per day, we call it anuria. The most common cause for oliguria is dehydration, shock, when the blood volume is less and the body is trying to preserve all the volume, all the blood volume. Acute kidney injury and chronic kidney diseases are also other causes where the urine output decreases. Polyuria, on the other hand, is when the urinary output is excess, seen in diabetes mellitus, diabetes insipidus, nephrotic syndrome, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, and the most common thing is overdrink of water. In diabetes, because of osmotic diuresis, as the glucose comes outside, it takes the water along with it and that causes polyuria. In diabetes insipidus, because the ADH hormone is not functioning adequately, the body is not able to concentrate urine and that's why the urine which is coming out is large volume and diluted. Nephrotic syndrome is a condition where a lot of proteins are lost in the urine and this protein exerts osmotic pressure causing osmotic diuresis. Diabetes insipidus is a medical condition. Syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion occurs usually following brain surgery. Color of the urine. The normal color of the urine is pale straw color. You could get red, red color urine when a person has got hematuria, that is passing blood in the urine. Drugs like rifampicin, which is used in the treatment of, diabetes, of tuberculosis, can cause red color urine. Other thing, food substances like beetroot can also cause the urine to be red in color. Yellow color, a dark yellow color urine is usually a concentrated urine. When there is conjugated hyperbilirubinemia or conjugated jaundice, that time the bile pigments come in the urine which causes the dark urine color. Drugs like B-complex is also known to increase the color of the urine to dark yellow. Black color urine is seen classically in a condition called alcaptanuria, which is a disease associated with homogenesis acid oxidase deficiency. The urine on standing progressively becomes darker. Green color urine is rarely seen in a kind of urinary tract infection created caused by a bacteria called pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is known to produce a green color pigment that can color the urine to give a green color, though very rare. The smell of the urine normally is ammoniacal in nature. A fruity color smell can be seen when ketone bodies are detected in the urine, like uh, these occurs in ketoacidosis, be it diabetes or starvation. The smell of dead rat is usually associated with phenylketonuria due to the presence of a product phenylacetylglutamine. Burnt sugar or maple syrup urine smell is seen in a condition where there is a defect in the branch chain amino acid metabolism. The pH of the urine is normally slightly acidic in nature. When we have metabolic acidosis, the pH of the urine is very low. In metabolic alkalosis, the body tries to get rid of all the excess alkali through the urine and the urine becomes alkaline in nature. Specific gravity. This is the first physical test that we actually do. 
this is a test which checks the specific gravity of if it's a ratio of the specific gravity of the urine to that of water taken as one putting it simply it is the weight of urine divided by the weight of equal volume of water specific gravity is a tubular function test the normal range of specific gravity is very high it's between 1.005 to 1.030 it indicates whether the urine is concentrated or dilute. It's important to know that a single reading of specific gravity really does not tell us anything. In an appropriate situation, when we do the uh, specific gravity, we can know a lot of information of the disease. For example, if we do not give water to the patient for 8 to 12 hours, classically ask the person not to drink water throughout the night, that would be about 10 hours of sleep. The next day morning's urine sample should be very concentrated because the body will be trying to preserve all the volume. If the urine is not concentrated, we know that the kidney has a problem in concentrating urine. On the other hand, if we give a person 2 liters of water or 1 liter of water, the excess volume overload, the kidney will try to get rid of it by throwing out 80% of the water by about 2-3 hours and the specific gravity will be low. So if you can demonstrate these, we are testing whether the tubular function of the kidney is good or not. How to take the reading? We collect, take the urine in a, uh, in a test tube, in a beaker, and then we put the urinometer. We give the urinometer a sway, a rotation till it comes to a rest. And then on the, on the stem of the urinometer, we take the reading. The reading we get is the specific gravity of the urine. The important thing we need, to, we need to remember is that urinometers are calibrated at 15 degrees centigrade. If the ambient temperature is different from 15 degrees centigrade, then some temperature correction has to be made. For every 3 degrees rise in temperature, we have to increase the specific gravity by 0.001 units. So, for example, if the room temperature is 24 degrees centigrade and the specific gravity was 1.015 on the urinometer, then we have to do correction, temperature correction. What is the difference in temperature? 24 minus 15, which is 9 degrees centigrade. For every 1 degree centigrade, every 3 degrees centigrade change in temperature, we have to increase the specific gravity by 0 0.001. For 9 degrees change in temperature, we would have to increase the specific gravity by 0.003. So the final specific gravity, the corrected specific gravity will be 1.015 plus 0.003, which will be 1.018. Proteins. This is the structure of the glomerulus. And as long as the glomerular membrane is intact, the proteins being large does not get filtered. Also, the glomerulus membrane has got a negative charge. The proteins in the blood has got a negative charge. The negative charge and the negative charge repulse each other. So, proteins don't come in the urine. Whenever we have any damage to the glomerular membrane, this protein can filter through the glomerulus and come into the urine. So, if we get proteins in the urine, then we are dealing with a case of damage in the glomerulus. The two tests for testing for proteins, one is the heat coagulation test and other is the sulfosalicylic acid test. The heat coagulation test is specific for albumin. Now what we do in this test is that we set the pH of the urine to 5.4 which is equal to the PI or the isoelectric pH of albumin. At this pH, if we heat the, if we heat the urine, the urine, the albumin in the urine will coagulate and will appear to us. So, presence of a coagulum at 5.4 degrees, at 5.4 pH suggests that albumin is present in the urine. Normally, we take the test tube, we put the urine, we add a few drops of acetic acid to acidify the urine and then we heat the top end of the test tube. After heating it, if you find that a coagulum develops, then it confers that albumin is present in the urine. The other proteins in the urine, especially hemoglobin, will not give this test. If we want to detect the presence of proteins in the urine, then we have to use colloidal alkaloids 
like trichloroacetic acid or sulfosalicylic acid. When we add these acids to the urine, the proteins present in the urine precipitate, albuminin precipitate, and all the other proteins also present in the urine, like hemoglobin or myoglobin, they will also precipitate. This is the best test to detect presence of proteins. We take the urine, we add a few drops of sulfosalicylic acid, we shake the urine, you will find that precipitates are formed. Presence of precipitates would indicate that proteins are there in the urine. Glucose test. The common test done for detecting glucose in the urine is the Benedict's test. The principle of the Benedict's test is that in alkaline pH, the glucose present in the urine forms any diol. The any diol has reducing properties and will reduce the Cu2 plus to Cu plus. Cu2 plus is present in the Benedict solution, which is Benedict solution, a copper sulfate in a weakly alkaline medium. The copper sulfate will, the Cu2 plus ions of copper sulfate will get converted to Cu plus and that will form precipitates. The chain, the copper sulfate solution is blue in color. As the concentration of the urine increases, the reduction will be more. So there's a, so there'll be a gradual change from blue to green to yellow to orange to red. Now, it is important to note that this is one test where the volumes that we use has to be very specific. 5 ml of the reagent and 0.5 ml of the urine. Why we need to do this is because it is a semi-quantitative test. Based on the color we get, this is the blue color, this is the green color, this is the red color. Based on the colors that we get, we can have a rough approximate estimation of how much the blood glucose would be. Ketone bodies. Ketone bodies are produced in two extreme conditions, starvation and diabetic ketoacidosis. The ketone bodies in the urine would be uh, acetone, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Now we don't have any tests for beta-hydroxybutyrate, but the tests for detecting acetone, acetoacetate are the Rotheras test and the Gerhardt's test. In this lab, we are performing the Rotheras test. Rotheras test detects acetone and acetoacetate. Now, the principle of the test is, first we have to saturate the urine with ammonium sulfate. Then we add a little bit of sodium nitroprusside, and after mixing it up thoroughly, we gently put a few drops of ammonia on the sides of the test tube, and the end result is the presence of this violet ring. If we get a violet ring like this, then the presence of ketone bodies is detected. As I said, ketone bodies would be present either in cases of starvation or in diabetic ketoacidosis. Another important thing is acetone and acetoacetate are the two ketone bodies which would be detected, but beta hydroxybutyrate, which actually is the largest quantity of ketone bodies present in the blood or urine, does not get detected by this test. Detection of blood in the urine. Uh, when there is severe damage to the glomerulus, as in glomerular nephritis, blood can also come into the urine. Frank observation of a reddish color urine would suggest hematuria. The principle for detecting blood in the urine is the benzidine test. The principle of this test is that hemoglobin, or for that myoglobin, has got an oxidase catalase activity. It reacts with H2O2 to form nascent oxygen. The nascent oxygen reacts with a benzidine reagent to give a blue or green color. Myoglobin also has this catalase property and they will also give the test positive. So, to do the test, we have to take a control and the test. The control will be the urine, the benzidine reagent, and in place of H2O2, we add water. The, the test will be the urine, H2O2, and the benzidine reagent. If the color becomes this dark green or blue in color, the presence of RBCs is or hemoglobin is confirmed. Bile salts. Bile salts are sodium and potassium salts of glycocholic acid and taurocholic acid. These are present in the bile and in cases of obstructive jaundice, they find their way into the blood vessel 
and can filter in the kidney and come in the urine. The property of the biosalts is to reduce the surface tension, which is actually used for the absorption of fats. Now, when biosalts comes in the urine, they reduce the surface tension. And this is what we are going to detect by the Hay sulfur test. In the Hay sulfur test, we use sulfur powders. We have to add little quantity of sulfur powder. In normal water or normal urine, the sulfur powder will float. But if biosalts are present in the urine, the surface tension is reduced. So these will tend to settle in the bottom. If you see the presence of bile salts and bile, bile salts in the urine, then we know that the patient is having obstructive jaundice. It is important to put a control and the test. First, we take water, we fill it up to two thirds the size of the test tube, and then we gently spring, uh, sprinkle sulfur powder. This will not sink. This is the first thing we have to do to confirm that the sulfur powder that we are using is actually good. Then in the urine sample, when you put the same sulfur powder, they will tend to go into the urine and that will indicate that the surface tension has reduced and hence bile salts are present in the urine. Bile pigments. Bile pigments is conjugated bilirubin. Conjugated bilirubin is soluble and whenever the levels of conjugated bilirubin increases, that will come in the urine. This is detected by a test called the Fauchet's test. The principle of the Fauchet's test is, first we adsorb all the conjugated bilirubin on barium sulfate. Barium sulfate will adsorb all the bilirubin pigments present in the urine. This is then filtered into a filter paper. To this filtrate, we add Fauchet's reagent, which is perichloride in HCl. Perichloride is an oxidizing agent. It will oxidize bilirubin to biliburdin which is green in color, and bilisanin, which is blue in color. The combination of the two gives a pista color. First, we add barium chloride and magnesium sulfate to the urine sequentially so that barium sulfate is formed. Then we shake the test tube properly for some time so that all the bile pigments get adsorbed onto the barium sulfate. This is then filtered. To the filtrate, we add ferric chloride, and this is the pale bluish green color that you will see in the bottom of the filter paper where the barium sulfate is present. Presence of this bluish green pista color suggests that bile pigments are present. What are bile pigments? Conjugated bilirubin detected in the urine.